Good morning and welcome once again to Digital Look TV from London. Joining us today is Nick Beecroft. He is a German and senior market analyst at Saxo Capital Markets. Mr. Beecroft, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Okay, overnight, the minutes of the last U.S. Federal Reserve policy meeting. Mm. They seem to have moved markets a bit. Everybody is talking about, almost everybody is talking about the possibility of December tapering. Mm. Do you share that prognosis that you think that is a real risk or not? I think it's a low probability. I think it's, I put it out at 20% probability. Mm. I think we would need to see really very strong uh, uh, numbers for the U US unemployment report coming out on, on the beginning of December for November. We need to see non-farm payrolls over 200,000. We need to see a good, in inverted commas, fall in the unemployment rate, uh, not just due to a reduction in the participation rate. And I don't see those things coming through. So I'm looking more for March. 20% chance in December, 30% in March, 50% beyond March uh, would be my uh, guesses. So March at the soonest? Yeah, I think so. And, and that's, uh, that's my, uh, that's my, probably uh, my, my central tendency. Mm. Um, but uh, there's a possibility of beyond March, as I say. The Fed minutes were full of discussions about different alternatives, even to cap rates, lower the interest rate on excess reserves. Mm a very wide-ranging discussion. It seems like FOMC members are quite cautious. Yeah, I think they are. They're cautious um, because they were spooked by what happened during the summer, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, following Bernanke's uh, uh, tips, suggestions, hints that we may be going to get tapering. Mm -hmm. They were spooked by the absolute amount of the rise in longer-term yields. You know, the 10-year yield rising from, let's say, 145 to 3%. They were also spooked, and probably more so, in fact, by the rise in intermediate yields at two, three, four, and five years, which they don't want to see. They want us to believe the forward guidance for rates. The rates are going to be roughly where they are, zero, for the next three years. And they're striving desperately to uh, separate those two phenomena. The uh, introduction of tapering, which they want to do, because I think they see diminishing returns from tapering. They see dangers. They see possible mispricing of assets uh, because of uh, QE. Uh, they see the return of covenant light loans, which are now getting back to levels seen before the crisis. That's QE. They want to get rid of that, but they want to convince us that Fed funds are going to be zero uh, or 12 and a half basis points for a very long time. Okay. Speaking before the interview, you commented to us the possibility that Yellen, you believe, will be quite good as head of the Fed because of her skills as an economic theorist, econometrician. Mm. Um, if you could perhaps... Yeah, sure. Yeah, she, she's famously um, uh, a, an expert uh, modeler, mm -hmm. using models to, to, uh, to gauge where the US economy is going. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to come to the fore in this discussion about strengthening forward guidance. We're seeing uh, these various possibilities discussed in, in the minutes, either lowering the uh, employment rate threshold to 6% or 5.5%, mm -hmm. you know, which implies use of the so-called optimal uh, policy model mm -hmm. where you would uh, put up with potentially higher rates of inflation for a short while to get up the employment, to get the, sorry, to get the employment, unemployment rate down uh, on the understanding that you'd then control in inflation subsequently. Mm. Yeah, that's a very lax policy. Mm. Um, but she is perfectly placed to explain and promote those kind of policies with her colleagues at the Fed, and she has that credibility to be able to do that as well. But those minutes were extraordinary. They, uh, they're very candid in the sense that they show uh, they show us, I believe, they're keen to do QE when it's safe, to QE tapering when it's safe. Uh, they also show us this desperation to keep the market believing that Fed funds are going to stay between 0 and 25 basis points for a very long time. And they just seem to discuss everything but the power of prayer to, uh, to try and make that uh, happen, whether it's cutting the, the rate on, over, on uh, reserves placed at the Fed, uh, uh, putting a lower bound on what they would uh, um, put up with in terms of inflation, uh, lowering the uh, unemployment rate target. Uh, everything's on the table in that respect. Desperation. <laughs> let's be kind. Let's, let's say just a, just a full and frank discussion of every possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. European Central Bank. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of talk lately or market chatter, also, also from some ECB officials yeah. about the possibility 
of contemplating going into negative territory on the deposit rate paid by the ECB on banks' reserves mm. at the central bank, at the monetary authority. However, the ECB and other policymakers are a bit wary of just where that will take them, what the real effects might be. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, there's a series of outcomes, a range of outcomes which are possible. Yeah. Could you please run us through that range of outcomes, some of the possible risks? Sure, yeah. It, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. you know, this cut to negative rates would be difficult to digest for the more conservative members of the board, uh, by which I mean the Bundesbank, uh, really. Uh, and yet we've heard uh, Jörg Asmussen uh, countenance the possibility. He said, uh, in fact I was there present when he said, uh, yes, we're talking about it, it's a possibility, but we'd have to, I'm paraphrasing, we would have to take that step after very careful consideration. He didn't rule it out completely. Mm. They're worried, on the one hand, the costs, possible uh, negative effects on the operation of money markets. Mm. Uh, it, it, it may reduce the amount of interbank lending, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, it may cause, uh, it may cause uh, in the end, uh, banks to offer negative rates to, to depositors, reduce liquidity in the system, uh, sticky deposits from consumers could disappear, mm -hmm. consumers put the money uh, in cash under a mattress, uh, these kind of concerns uh, with debatable benefits. But one benefit which I think they would realize and are very aware of is that would be, if you like, the, uh, the, the nuclear uh, option for reducing the value of the euro. Okay. If the euro goes over 140, then I mm -hmm. think that makes a reduction in uh, the deposit rate to negative territory uh, the greatest possibility. That's the, the least controversial and most accepted benefit of a negative deposit rate. Okay, fantastic. Um, Okay, moving on, another geographical area, China. Mm. Uh, recently, we had the results of the third plenum of yeah. the Central Committee, Communist Party, mm -hmm. and they announced a series of reforms, extremely wide-ranging as well, uh -huh. very Chinese, as you were telling me before, yeah. very long-term. Mm. Uh, they really go to some of the pillars of their command economy system, of a communist uh, society, um, relaxing a little bit the ownership rights for land, which is something extremely important for a communist country, and also freeing up the movement of labor, amongst other things, mm -hmm. uh, emphasizing the role of the market, as you were explaining to me. Mm -hmm. mm, but really, they're very long-term, a bit ethereal. Mm -hmm. How positive are these reforms? Pretty positive, and, and, and just a progression from what we've seen over the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Very Chinese, very measured, uh, significant, you know, managing that country of 1.3 billion people, uh, you, you, by definition, is, is a lot of inertia, uh, and it's it, and and always managing this transition from a purely rural economy to a partly urbanised economy is uh, is the challenge that the the leadership faces. But very positive. Uh, you mentioned some of the benefits, uh, the sort of structural reforms that, uh, ironically, we need to see uh, in, in parts of Europe. Uh, you know, uh, maybe not the exact same reforms, because we've had a number of those, obviously, for, for tens of, or if not decades, uh, sorry, decades or centuries in Europe. But it's interesting, the comparison between how a command economy can bring in those long-term structural report reforms, whereas some of the uh, democracies, let's say Spain and Italy, are finding it difficult to introduce structural reforms that the ECB and the, uh, and the uh, if you like, the governing powers in the EU would like to see. But getting back to China, I think it, 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 it's good news. It, it's a, just a progression. We're getting towards a rebalancing uh, to consumption away from an export-driven economy. That's going to require the creation of, and, and of uh, more of a social net to stop uh, such excessive saving on the part of consumers, more consumer spending. But it'll gradually uh, take place, and these are very positive uh, steps in that direction. Okay. From the long term to the short term. Mm -hmm. What are the risks that we might see a uh, more, uh, more quicker than expected and more protracted than expected slowing in Chinese economic activity in 2014? Um, 2014, uh, I, I'd say it's perfectly possible that we see sub 7%. You know, something in the six to seven percent range, mm -hmm. and the leadership understands that they're trying very slowly uh, to get us used to the fact that 10% growth 
is A, a thing of the past, mm. and, and the reason it's a thing of the past is that was export driven. Mm. And they've embraced this move to a more uh, consumptive society. And that, that's all part of this, the, the, the same thing. You can't have one without the other. Mm. So six or you know mid sixes next year wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's a crisis, and we have to get used to the fact that the ten percent per annum is, is history. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we want the uh, the benefits, which it would bring the globe mm -hmm. to see this move to more consumption in China, mm -hmm. you know, uh, less uh, less imbalance in, in trade in that sense, mm -hmm. then uh, we have to see the downside, accept the downside of slightly lower growth. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't certainly don't see a collapse in the Chinese economy. No. Okay. So s the possibility of slightly lower than expected growth, mm. but overall you would describe yourself as sanguine? Yes, indeed. And, and uh, I think the thing is, luck they're very lucky, the Chinese, uh, or they, maybe they've been very wise, the Chinese have great resources at their disposal in terms of further fiscal stimulation if required, monetary stimulation, $4 trillion in reserves. You know, uh, uh, I, I'm not worried about China because they have that ammunition left uh, if they need to use it. Okay. One possible, perhaps theoretical is not the right word, but one scenario that some observers have commented in the recent past, a uh, financial crisis in China uh, because of excess lending to the property sector, etc. Mm -hmm. What's the risk? Uh, once again, I'm pretty sanguine about that. I think if you had a banking crisis, uh, we may never hear about it. It would be solved over a weekend. Used to be the case that the Bank of England in the UK would call the relevant parties in over the weekend and solve a crisis. We saw that in the, in the 70s uh, property crisis in the UK. I think the same would happen in China. We may never even hear about it. Uh, and, and they have the resources to cope with that situation. Okay. Closer to home, United Kingdom. Um, it seems that the Bank of England, or the, rather the markets have accepted the Bank of England's perhaps modifications, tweaking of their forecasts. However, you have cable. Um, if we have some currency peers such as dollar yen possibly breaking out of the recent ranges, mm. euro dollar might not do quite what the ECB wants of it. Mm. Um, what can we expect for cable? How might that affect the Monetary Policy Committee mm. and its um, reaction function? Well, I, I think uh, cable uh, is set pretty far in the near term by which I mean the first quarter of next year. Mm -hmm. um, I think the strength of the, US con uh, the UK economy can, if anything, surprise to the upside. Um, and, and certainly relative to the US economy in the first quarter of next year, which I think is going to look pretty anemic, say 1.5% annual growth, mm -hmm. annualised growth. Uh, so the UK could stand out in that sense, and you see, could see cable rise over 165 towards 170. Yeah, you know what? I don't think the Bank of England will be too concerned about that. Um, you know, they, uh, they're, they're trying to convince us that rates will stay lower for longer here uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, they will see, I think there will there'll be dangers of overheating in various parts of the UK economy uh, and, and some uh, mild tightening uh, due to a rise in sterling won't be entirely unwelcome. And I think the miles away from any further easing decision. Mm -hmm. you know, Not more, entirely more unwelcome, cooing. the tightening. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's covert in the sense of it, it wouldn't be an embarrassing, uh, you know, rise in rates, which they were promising us, you know, three months ago wasn't going to happen for uh, until 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it, we're seeing such... Uh, such positive uh, development in UK numbers, then, then they may not be wholly unconcerned by a, by a rise in sterling. So uh, I think cable uh, is looking pretty good over the next quarter. Okay, very interesting. Japan, short term. A lot of people, some people certainly, expect the yen to continue to weaken against the US dollar. Do you share that prognosis? Yeah, I do, um, because I think um, we have uh, a situation where the BOJ is, is a willing partner mm -hmm. in this uh, in Abenomics, if mm -hmm. you like. Mm -hmm. There's a real contrast there with the ECB. The ECB has been, been dragged kicking and screaming into many of its uh, easing uh, efforts, its monetary stimulation. Because the ECB sees a moral hazard, they think if they ease too much, it takes the pressure off governments in Southern Europe, let's say, to reform. Are they completely wrong? Uh, possibly not, no. Uh, monetary policy is easy, it, it's a drug. 
uh, compared to long-term structural reforms. The sort of long-term structural pain that Germany went through in the 90s, uh, you know, th those are difficult policies to introduce. Uh, I think in Japan you have a different dynamic. You have the BOJ, new leadership, very much part of Abenomics, the three arrows. Uh, they're one of the arrows. They will support that. And I don't think they'll demand... Uh, you know, a quid pro quo from Abe in terms of long-term reforms before they introduce more easing. Mm -hmm. You know, they realize finally, uh, you may say, all the authorities in Japan have got the message that they have to do something radical to fight this uh, horrible deflation. Uh, and, and everyone does have the message now. And, and I'm not going to predict uh, a Japanese debt crisis. Um, it, uh, uh, it, it's been a long-term line, long -term time coming and there are uh, many uh, many stories of people predicting that uh, too early but surely in the next three to five years at the most mm -hmm. Japan is going to face a crisis due to its enormous debt burden even net debt burden uh, taking into account private savings and the way out of that is going to be uh, inflation and debasement of the currency mm -hmm. So uh, I, both short, medium and long term, uh, I would be a dollar bull against the yen, certainly. Okay. And also as far as at the global level, economic authorities and as well investors mm. for their own medium, long term investments, mm. they should be aware that perhaps uh, the global ramifications which the Japanese crisis could eventually have on their portfolios? Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think you uh, don't have to take action now. I think before that, you see more quantitative easing in Japan, which will find its way around the world. That flood of money, which it is right now, will find its way around the world. That, that's partly responsible for the uh, level of the S&P in the right. States. Mm -hmm. It's not just American QE. If the, the Fed's balance sheet, as we see quite often in charts, is, is percent, percentage-wise uh, nowhere near as large as, as, uh, as uh, Japan's, as a, as a percentage of GDP. Mm -hmm. Uh, that money finds its way against the world, so don't fight that. Yeah, maybe, uh, and that, um, in the Japanese sense, I think goes on for years, mm. two, three years, let's mm -hmm. say. So that's way down the road, and you'd miss out. Um, you know, the, in the U.S., uh, you know, U.S. Uh, the the, the pro my prognosis, though, for the S and P, let's say, mm. is much more sanguine. Uh, uh, sorry, much much more fearful. Correct myself. Okay. I think there's every chance uh, that we it's flying on fumes. Yeah, it has been flying on on uh, on these fumes from around the world, mm -hmm. so we could see we could see pullbacks or just a at the, at the very least just a steady year in the S and P next year. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So, because uh, at some stage you get this uh, crossover when the in the second half of next year I can see the U.S. economy starting to look very good and to outperform, mm -hmm. and bond yields rising uh, really quite rapidly in the mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, and, and that puts pressure on, on the equity market. And, and by then, I think we will have seen uh, tapering of QE uh, in the sec by the second half of... This. I think QE will be finished by the end of 2014, put it that way. Mm -hmm. So probably I'd see a rapid tapering between March, June and the end of the year uh, so on a for the U.S. Right. So on a tactical basis, towards the end of this year, perhaps rotate some funds out of the U.S.? Yeah, towards yeah. The markets. Yeah, I think uh, I'd probably prefer the Nikkei to uh, to the S and P, for instance, okay. uh, in that sense, um, and uh, uh, and just take some uh, take some money off the table in terms of that U.S. risk market. Yeah, fantastic. Mm. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Mm. Uh, we do hope you will join us again. Very very welcome, Mr. Nick Beecroft, German and senior market analyst at Saxo Capital Markets. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And that's all from us here at Digital Look for today. We hope you will join us again next week. Goodbye.